much, and we'll welcome up uh, Gary Rosen, who is going to be uh, giving us a patient perspective uh, before the breakout session. I'll give directions on the breakout session immediately after. Gary, welcome. Excellent. Good afternoon. Um, when I was asked initially to uh, address the group, I started jotting down notes, um, trying to think of you know how I wanted to say things at all. And all of a sudden, they started to look very familiar to me. And after thinking a little bit and a little chemo brain clearing, um, I realized that back in uh, 2014, I had written an essay for um, I, uh, about my perception and perspective of dealing with uh, cancer. So for the first time in my career, of, and I've done a number of presentations, I'm actually going to read part of it. So I apologize a little bit for that, but it does address it. and. Um, it also is a little bit dated, so I'm going to go in and out a little as I get to that. Um, the, the presentation was actually written for a publication that they have, a program at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, where I'm a patient. And um, it's called Visible Inc., and it's a program that was set up for patients who are interested in writing. They have, I think it's well over 100 uh, mentors now, and the last statistic I saw, they had over a thousand patients who have written oh, since 2008 when the program was begun. Um, they've written over 40,000 pages. So some folks have actually published books as a result of the program. And so I kind of got it to me one day and, and sat down and wrote a small essay. It was only a page and a half, but they did put it into their little publication there. Um, so anyway, let me begin. Um, in 2008, I was diagnosed with cholangio carcinoma, um, and cancer of the bile duct. Uh, just to kind of put things in perspective, I'm somebody, many of you know me, and um, I'm somebody who thinks it's very important to have a positive attitude and that it's very important in staying healthy and, and beating this, this scourge. And um, to kind of put that in perspective, two months before I was diagnosed, the company that I worked for at the time, Lehman Brothers, um, went bankrupt. And then, you know, dealing with that, right after that, I was diagnosed with cholangiocarcinoma. So, you know, just to kind of give you a perspective of, you know, sometimes it's a lot more even than just the cancer that you're dealing with, but I do think it's very important to stay positive. Um, all right, it's a very rare form of cancer, and this is stuff a lot of us here know. It's a very rare form of cancer that tends to be lethal and currently has no cure. Now, remember, this is from 2014 when I wrote it. Um, still, I consider myself to be quite fortunate, especially because of my family history. My mother developed ovarian cancer at the age of 67. She passed away at the age of 89 after open heart surgery. Um, my mother had a, this little aside, my mother had a very strong attitude also to keeping a positive outlook on things. And one of the things she used to do, and some of you might find this helpful, is she would sit down somewhere quiet and envision Pac-Man swimming through her body, eating the cancer cells. And um, after having taken a tumor the size of a small melon out, the surgeon hadn't given her great odds, but she beat it. So, you know, something to keep in mind. Uh, my brother was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer at the age of 46 and was unfortunately gone in a week. My father developed colon cancer, had it surgically removed, and it metastasized to his lung in a couple of years. He did have surgery on the lung, and then he eventually died from pulmonary hypertension several years later at the age of 80. With a family history like this, 
How am I fortunate? First and most important, my condition is genetic. I am BRCA2 positive. Now, I've since realized that the condition isn't genetic, but being BRCA2 positive affects my body's ability to fight the cancer. So, um, you know, but, but it is genetically linked. And very fortunately, both of my daughters have been tested and they came out negative for the mutation. Um, so the mutation in my bloodline ends with me, thank goodness. Uh, my daughter Gabrielle, who's in her upper 30s, um, works in the music industry. And my younger daughter Jessica, who's in the lower 30s, um, is an American Sign Language interpreter. And since I wrote this, she's also working at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. Um, Gabby and Jess are both, well, in their 30s, and were quite relieved, as you could imagine, by the test results. Second, when I was told by my doctor in the fall of 2008 that I had biliary cancer, I didn't have a typical reaction of impending doom, which I've never had. Um, given my family history, I always expected to develop some sort of cancer, so this wasn't a surprise. In fact, my mother and I used to argue about it because um, my wife Pat and I have been, and my daughters have been vegetarians, the girls their whole lives, and we started at 70, so my, uh, in 1970. And um, my mother used to say, well, you know, you, you eat much more healthy than I do, and your father did, and you know, you're gonna be okay. Well, anyway, so much for that. Um, all right, so, so uh, given the family history, I always expected to develop cancer, and it wasn't a surprise. My attitude, oh well, here it is, and I need to deal with it. I still feel fortunate, however. Um, third is that from the beginning, I've been receiving treatments at MSK. In fact, doc, Dr. Abu Alpha, I'm not sure he's here yet, but he's my oncologist, and I owe him a lot. Um, this place has doctors who have extensive experience with rare cancers such as mine and know the best treatments at the moment. Also, the chemo nurses, and I had added this because chemo nurses are really the angels that don't get recognition. Um, they're incredible. I've never met so many caring people. Every two weeks I go for treatments. I'm greeted by a smiling nurse who is truly interested in how I fared since my last visit. They check my blood work, the vitals. You now, the doctor checks these also, but then they, they take a second look and sometimes pick up the phone and call and say, you know, did you see this or did you see that? Um, so they check the vitals and treat me in a gentle and professional manner. Several of them, after working with cancer patients all week, participate in cycle for survival events to raise funds in support of research into rare cancers. They're truly amazing people. And for those of you who um, don't know about cycle for survival, it's a program that was started by a patient at um, Memorial Sloan Kettering um, who had cancer and she was a very active person. And she started this program and um, the program has been going on for many years, and they, I mean, it, they get people to, they fill a room like this with exocycles, and the people get on these things and ride, and they get, uh, um, you know, they, they raise funds for it, and um, it's been, I believe the number is about $10 million since it's begun, and the money goes all to rare cancers. Um, Okay, well, getting back to my, my essay, which we're almost done with, I'm a realist and understand that something will eventually do me in, but I'm not convinced it will be this. I know that I have a serious condition, and I don't fool myself into thinking it doesn't matter, but I'm getting the best treatment available, and I expect to hold on until they find a sledgehammer to whack my tumor. So am I fortunate? In a very bizarre way, I believe I am. And I'm sorry, I haven't been moving this ahead. Um, some, some general notes, uh, because when I meet people, everybody here always wants to know what everyone's been on. When I first was diagnosed in 2008, um, actually in January 2009, we started the chemo treatments. Um, I had gemcitabine and cisplatin for the first 16 months or so. 
I am not a candidate for surgery because unfortunately the tumor, which did shrink, is right up against the major blood vessel, so it's not something they can go in there and, and do. After about 16 months, we had to discontinue that, that combination. Um, it was starting to affect my uh, kidneys, and my feet are absolutely numb. Um, so, you know, we, we um, then switched to uh, arenotecan and fluxoridine. Now, I have a picture there of the um, Codman 3000 hepatic infusion pumps. Okay, um, I put that up there just to kind of uh, tell you if, if you're in any way technically curious, if you go to their site, this, that, those little things are engineering marvels. It's something that's put right under your skin and your abdomen with the catheter leading into the bloodstream going right up into the, um, into the liver. And so it's 100% delivery. So for instance, the, the arenotecan would go in my metaport and be systemic. The um, fluxardine would be a, the slightest amount, but it would feed directly into the liver, so it was getting to right where it needed to be. Very effective. Um, I did, however, start to run into a problem. At a certain point, my alkaline phosphatase, which is one of the measures that they look at, started to increase um, significantly to the point that they had to discontinue putting chemo in the pump and they switched to steroids and saline trying to bring any inflammation down. And for months um, I was on that and we couldn't get the, the level to come down to anything that uh, was acceptable. Um, and this is, it kind of addresses the question a little bit about nutrition. Um, I happen to read an article in Consumer Reports, of all places, about arsenic in rice. And um, why did that make a difference? Well, when you're on chemo, your stomach generally gets really messed up. And um, I had found that rice milk was very settling. And there were weeks where I was consuming five, six liters a week of, of rice milk. Um, it helped with, you know, uh, with, with feeling better. Um, it helped with, with diarrhea. And, you know, as I say, it was settling. However, after reading about the arsenic, I discontinued it, okay? There's no proof about it or anything, I can tell you. But within about a month, my alkaline phosphatase, which indicates some inflammation in the liver, started to come down to the point that we were able to start putting chemo back into the pump. So something to think about, okay? Um, an update on my current situation, as of uh, last April, we have decided to, the doctors uh, you know, advised me that since nothing had changed in my, my uh, tumor, it, hadn't, it had shrunk significantly and um, was now stable for several years. Um, they kind of felt it was worth the risk, and so we discontinued the chemo as of last April, and we're using um, PET scans and CAT scans to monitor it, and um, it still to this day continues to show zero activity. So I hesitate to use the term that the tumor is dead because it's cancer, uh, you know. But um, it's, you know, it's been a success, and it just, you know, to me, it's just a, an indicator that, you know, um, chemo works. Um, it can work, you know, not for everybody. Um, but also, you know, a, a strong attitude and, and, you know, not accepting doom, I think, is also very helpful. So my last, my last points, um, you know, as far as observations and, and all, I would say, you want highly experienced doctors. Um, you know, unfortunately, there are areas in the country where the doctors may have never seen somebody with cholangiocarcinoma, or they've only seen a few. You know, you you really want to get yourself to a top cancer society or cancer center. Um, you definitely want to. I didn't put that on here, but you want to. You know, monitor the CCF website for all sorts of wonderful information. 
um, and keep a positive can-do attitude, okay? Because you really want to have the, the determination to fight the battle, okay? And hopefully, uh, you know, come out a winner, all right? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.